All right. So we're recording now, and uh, yeah. Um, so um, tell me a little bit about yourself, if you. So my name is uh, Swan Sona. I'm a philosophy student at Kansas State University. Uh, the areas of philosophy that I focus on are the philosophy of religion, metaphysics, and ethics. Those are the three areas that I'm really interested in. For a while, I was interested in social and political philosophy, mm -hmm. but I found metaphysics and ethics were much more interesting. So right now, a lot of my work deals with things like the problem of evil, or um, just right now I'm working on a paper for a, for a medical school on uh, abortion. So that's going to be an interesting subject. And those are the kind of general things that I'm working on. I'm also doing a, a paper over the summer uh, and in preparation during this semester with the philosopher David Baguette on uh, the moral argument for the existence of God. I've come from a Thomistic background, so I follow the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, informed by Aristotle and Neoplatonic thought. So that's kind of my background. Uh, I really love these kinds of questions, and that's why I enjoy talking about philosophy. And I hope that, uh, you know, one of my goals is that when we discuss philosophy, the goal is always to learn, right? So if I'm expressing my, maybe I make a mistake, you know, just point it out and I'll try to fix it. It's mm. not about my ego. It's not about me proving that I'm right. It's about yeah. us getting at the truth and me trying to craft what I think is the best explanation. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You have pretty much uh, same interests that I have personally especially the metaphysics and the philosophy of religion you know it's kind of a i think it's probably the most essential and and crucial areas in the philosophy and uh, i would even claim that all the other areas in the philosophy would depend on those especially if you talk about epistemology and uh the basic uh, ontology or, or something else like this philosophy of religion. So, yeah. Um, so, we had uh, this plan to talk about rationality of belief in God and uh, mm -hmm. the atonement also. It's well, yeah, sure, it's part of theology, but, you know, it also has much to do with the philosophy of religion and metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, then this classical, the problem of evil, which is, I think, the strongest um, objection to theism, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. I think that theists... Uh, in the past and in present has succeeded to give alternative explanations such as the free will defense or something else. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, Suan, do you think that the belief in God is rational? In the first place. Yeah, I really do believe that believe in uh, that belief in God is rational. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe a good starting point is you know Graham uh, uh, Graham Oppie's work, or uh, is it Opie or Oppie? I don't know which one it is. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna say it's Opie. So Graham yeah. Opie in his book uh, arguing about gods, I think I really like how he begins with the position that look, belief in God is rational, and that okay, you the theist can really paint a picture of the world that is internally consistent. Mm. Now, he believes the naturalists can do the same thing. That's a heavy subject in and of itself. But for right now, I think that theism can provide an internally consistent explanation about the world. And that's really mm. important for at least passing a sniff test, right? If you're trying to uh, consider uh, a, a worldview, I consider worldviews as kind of like narratives or stories about reality. It has mm. characters. It has a plot. It has a structure. It's trying to tell you something about the world. And one of the tests is to see, like, is it the simplest explanation of all the facts that we have? Does it capture all the human experience? Does it make sense of what seems to be so apparent to us? And are those things that seem so apparent actually justifiable? Can they actually stand up to scrutiny? 
Mm. So when it comes to belief in the existence of God, uh, let's just first tackle the question. So I, you know, people often talk about, um, you know, so maybe there are three points that I can make here and then I'll get your feedback on it. Mm -hmm. So the first is that um, in epistemology, I think the general definition of what constitutes knowledge is, um, was it justified true belief? Mm -hmm. So it has to be justified in that we have rational faculties such that we could come to believe the thing in question. I think mm. that's what it is. Like it's reliable. We can trust that the knowledge that we have is knowledge, properly speaking. And the second thing is that independent of our faculties, uh, it must be the case that the proposition itself is true in some demonstrable way. So for instance, like, um, you know, take uh, Planinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism. His argument is not that we can't that naturalism is false. His argument mm. is that even if naturalism is false, we can't know that it's true. Therefore, no one can have knowledge that naturalism is true. Yeah. Now that's a that's an interesting question, right? Something to deal with. Um, so let's begin there, which is kind of a definition, and then let's get into two theories of truth. So, justified true belief under theism, it doesn't seem. It would seem, if, if we accept theism as a belief, that there exists a single divine being with all the, let's say, great making properties. If you like Nagas uh, Yujin Nagasawa's approach, the maximal compatible set of all these properties, so we can avoid the paradoxes of omnipotence, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have a being who has all these great, great making properties, who interacts with the world and genuinely cares about human beings, about human flourishing. Right, mm. So uh, a being who is metaphysically necessary and so forth, so forth, right? It would seem to be the case that we would have rational faculties under this view. Like it wouldn't be surprising that human mm. beings are able to really make, you know, predictions about reality and be, we would be able to make, um, what is it, inductive generalizations. So for science in particular, we see a phenomenon happen a certain number of times. We see that mm. the world operates on certain laws that seem fairly consistent and, uh, uh, this is what I think it's called nominologically speaking. So the laws of nature aren't laws of logic, but they are consistent enough such that we can rely and trust that the world is going to not fall apart, right? Or mm. that the laws of nature are constantly in warp and changing. So what we see then is we have a world that has order in it. We see a world in which we are able to make judgment claims that seem to hold up pretty well. And um, I like kind of, so... Uh, you know, Planiga has a book called God and Other Minds in which he basically says, look, um, how do I know? So he kind of says God is a, a, an, a, an unembodied mind. I don't know, like if you believe that mind and body are, are not separate, then that's going to be hard to accept. But let's say for the sake of argument, you accept that. So Planiga's claim that, look, you have to just trust by intuition. I think that's what he argues. It seems reasonable to believe or rational to believe that there are other minds that exist aside mm. from your own even if you can't demonstrably prove it. And the case also would apply to God, who is like an immaterial, uh, unembodied mind. So what you start finding is at least you can say, okay, there are things that seem at least compatible with theism. Theism is not internally inconsistent. And the next thing then is to question, all right, so it seems like we can say, uh, maybe belief in God is justified, perhaps, I don't know. I'm not much of an epistemologist. I know the basics of things, so. Mm. Uh, you know, as I said, I'm more of a metaphysician and an ethicist, so that's kind oh, yeah. of my, the, the area that I focus on. So then you have the coherence theory of truth and the correspondence theory of truth. In my opinion, I think that you kind of need both to actually have a proper view of the world. So coherence, right, internally consistent. It seems like this is the belief in God corresponds with our experience of the world and our judgments. And then the last thing is correspondence. And that's the really, I think, the big question. So Graham Opie, he says, look, belief in God is rational, uh, but it's not reasonable in the sense that, uh, you know, so it's not yeah. going to compel anybody, right? These arguments for the existence of God, they're, they're, they're decent. They can hold up to scrutiny, but they're not compelling. Oh, yeah. Am I compel yeah. So then the question is then, you know, what do you consider compelling under your view? So yeah. I don't know. Let, let's see like, what, if there's anything you want to unpack in that big ramble that I had there. Oh, yeah. There is actually a lot of things which you can uh, unpack. Uh, 
basically the idea of uh, how do we justify our basic beliefs, for example. Like, do we take this presuppositionalist uh, presupposition view or uh, reformed epistemology or classical foundationalism? So, in my opinion, well, I think if you, well, presuppositionalist view, in my opinion, isn't quite rational. Well, I know some people don't agree with me, but l let's just say you cannot uh, start with the assumption. I would say you have to rely on some kind of method like logic mm. or reason or deductive uh, reasoning. And the problem, the basic problem with the presupposition list is, is the exact thing that it relies on um, not some kind of uh, external method, which is in precisely the reason and logic itself. Because, you know, if I ask, well, how do I know that God exists? exists? Well, you know, it's obvious, you know it. Well, how do I know it? Then you start to use some logic and reason, and then you end up for holding your position, but that is precisely the problem, I think. And the second um, second view, when we talk about reformed epistemology, well, kind of, uh, I'm not sure there is some sort of criticism existing on this case, because when, when we talk about the uh, <clears throat> Belief that God, the the belief that God, believing in God is a uh, properly basic. Um, yeah, I don't see much problem with that, but there might be some problems because, for example, some uh, skeptics would uh, propose the idea. Well, what about other religious experiences? Are they justified or something else? And that's another question. But then, then we end up pretty much to consider the uh, classical view of this foundationalism, I would say. And uh, I'm not sure if there is any, any good criticism existing that would um, sort of make problems to that view. But I think uh, in the end, every epistemological position has its own weaknesses, weaknesses to justify the, uh, uh, the basic grounding of that epistemology. But I, I, mm. I do not think that, uh, for example, if you consider rationalism, that it's not justified. And this is the precise thing because, you know, we don't have any other method than logic and reason to begin with. <laughs> so I think those are, I would say that the, those are objective in a sense that they don't depend on us, on anything else. So, yeah. And when it comes to believing God, for example, it's, you know, we, how, how our belief in God is rational or justified is precisely the, uh, the thing that we have some sort of reason to believe in God or something else. So, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, one of the things that you mentioned in the beginning kind of got me thinking about. Um, so in just approaching the basic question on whether or not it's rational to believe in God. Mm. Um, so for me as a Thomist, as someone who is of the classical theist tradition, I admire Richard Swinburne and Alvin Plantinga because oh, yeah. their method their method is kind of like, okay, let's just begin with kind of things that we might share or already believe, right? Yep. So. For instance, Aquinas, when he does the five ways, he doesn't try to kind of appeal to common premises that everybody accepts. 
Aquinas, mm. right, has already established his entire metaphysical theory. And he's like, okay, here's what follows from my yeah. metaphysical theory. On the other hand, you know, like the arguments of like Josh Rasmussen and others kind of begins with like modal logic, basic propositions mm. that everybody can kind of accept. And that's admirable because I think it at least shows that belief in God is rational. Mm. But I don't know if it's going to get you all the way to really what Opie wants, which is a reasonable view, oh, a yeah. compelling view. I think uh, another thing that you mentioned too, and I don't know, I, I want to get your thoughts on this. So I'm not, I'm not really an epistemologist, so I'll try my best to kind of stay out of the debate unless you, know, oh, yeah. you can educate me or you know, inform me on that. <laughs> um, you know, Swinburne talks about kind of a, when he does the philosophy of mind, he talks about public events and private events, right? Mm. So a public event is that which like any other observer could experience or come to know or whatever, mm. right? So for example, uh, if there's a fire outside and you and I look outside, that's a public event, right? You don't yep. need some kind of privilege to access that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, let's say that um, when I stub my, if I stub my toe into this desk that's in front of me, I have a particular sensation of pain. Mm. And you might stub your toe into the desk or whatever in front of you, but you're privileged in that you are experiencing the pain as you would experience it. Mm. And likewise, for me, I'm experiencing it as I experience it. So I have a privileged position. Yep. I guess the, the goal of establishing a reasonable, aside from just a rational argument for the existence of God, is that we're trying to find something public, if that makes sense. Mm. Uh, and I'm not talking about like, let's say empiricism. I'm talking about something that you could access without necessarily being privileged, if you will. Um, so for example, this would kind of weaken arguments from religious experience because yeah. you have to be quite privileged, right? To yep. get those arguments. So yeah. they're not, yeah. So uh, what do you think about that so far? Yeah. Uh, well, when it comes to, for example, the religious experience, I think there is, you know, uh, the basic idea of religious experience can be combined with those two, I guess. Hmm. Since if you consider miracles or healings or those kinds of experiences, I would say that those are exactly religious experiences, which are observable and you are internally experiencing those things so you know in in your own experience that this happened and it it is justified and other people around you can uh, observe that fact well of course you can always doubt about those things well maybe there is a natural explanation or some kind of thing but regardless it's rational whether or not it's, it's uh, more plausible or not. I think, I think you cannot make a priori uh, conclusions to say that, well, you know, your healing experience was unjustified epistemologically mm -hmm. or something else, unless you have some kind of uh, a priori reasons to that. But still we have to be honest i would say and th mm. this is precisely the reason what i why i think that the uh, uh well the basic idea of rationalism for example makes the most perfect sense although i i really like the thomistic idea especially when you talk about metaphysics and natural theology i mean it's a great great thing you know, if you uh, take, for example, Edward Fieser's mm -hmm. The Five Proofs of the Existence of God, it's, it's quite amazing. But, you know, yeah, that's pretty much the case. And as well, if you think uh, the hiddenness of God, it's the same. If you cannot justify mm -hmm. your religious experience, by just experiencing, then it might be the case that the whole hiddenness of God issue is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because maybe you experience hiddenness of some kind of divine being. But are you justified to say that therefore God 
probably does not exist. Well, personally, I think the hiddenness of God uh, can be argued like deductively, but it still might have those problematic assumptions behind them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I think this is a sometimes quite complex when you actually think which beliefs or views are actually justified or which kind of method is justified and so on. And so when you think, for example, uh, people who simply deny, like for example, uh, the idea that you cannot, you can arrive uh, knowledge simply from other methods than science or your empirical experience. I think there is also as well problems within that system. So in in any case, we we have the same problem. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, maybe to close off this section and then move on to the atonement. Yeah. Uh, I think Kaiman Kwan's, argu- like the argument from religious experience that he has, I think it's basically... Um, from what I can understand, like the perfection of Richard Swinburne's mm. argument on religious experience. Oh, yeah. Because I think Haiman Kwan has like different epistemic principles. And I think his argument is not, his argument, from what I understood, you know, it's like the, the argument's like over 100 pages long. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, what he was arguing was look, for individual people who have had these experiences and they meet this specific criteria, of epistemic, um, you know, epistemic principles and filters. Like he says, we need a buffer for religious experiences, right? Mm. What you find is that there are certain religious experiences that can pass the buffer and hence can be justified. Yeah. And I think that's a very interesting claim. Um, I don't know, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I I think, you know, the basic idea of religious (laughs) experience can be justified regardless if you know the deity behind there. But for example, if you think, uh, let's say, uh, peer reviewed data about miracles or medical miracles, which we actually have, um, those, yeah, you can, basically you can uh, question the, uh, thing behind that experience you know what like uh, for example Alexander Pross uh, takes this some or similar case in his cosmological argument Uh, does does this um, argument have any religious interest yeah if you know what I mean so on the same in the same way I would say one one could say well does this event have any sort of religious interest? Well, if you, if you say that, you know, people have been praying for you and you have a couple witnesses who, uh, for example, say, well, yeah, I felt this um, feeling that, you know, this is going to happen precisely when I pray or something. And the, actual person who has experienced uh, the miracle actually testifies independently of that uh, witness for Mm -hmm. example or something else and then doctor says you know this is a miracle how can this happen and so on and so on so um, yeah of course if your experience has any kind of observable or justified let's say you can make a deductive case from your experience then sure it's justified and yeah i go back to the uh, basic idea of rationalism you know if you can make a case or reason then you know it's justified in i would say yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and then one last thing before we move on to the atonement I think Mm -hmm. that another important thing that people need to keep in mind when it comes to the debate on the existence of God is I think people 
in the beginning, they have really grandiose expectations on what arguments and reason can accomplish. Mm. So they'll begin all excited, like, oh, you know, the Kalam cosmological argument cannot be defeated. There are no good arguments against it. And then they're hit with like, uh, you know, like all sorts of like different objections and questions and like really complex metaphysics and especially physics. And Mm. they suddenly like start panicking and they say, all right, I'm done. God doesn't exist. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, no, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You, you got to recognize that like the process of reasoning and coming to, I mean, especially belief in God too. Like oh, yeah. for, God is not just a rational proposition. I mean, so if theism mm. is true, God is also a personal being who wants to connect with you. Mm-hmm. So if, if you just come to believe in the existence of God with the same kind of certainty that you have, let's say that, you know, there's a trash can in your room that's not what really the theistic God wants, mm, yep. right? So to find God, I would say that, you know, there, there has to be a real personal transformation in your life in which you recognize the personal dimension of reality, but you also see at least the rational plausibility of, right, uh, there being something supremely beyond us that is personal and loves us and wants to see us reach perfection. Yeah, so yeah. That's something to consider. Oh yeah, yeah. I would I would agree with the basic idea that theism implies uh, personality. For example, um, uh, yeah. When when I mentioned the Ed Fisher's book, he brings this up in in the long argument. It's it's like fifty premises. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's yeah. Th- this is the process of the thing, you know. You. If you if some argument has weaknesses or something else, you you don't have to just say okay, that's it. I don't have any case. Mm-hmm. Instead, you should be always open to alternative explanations or or you know you know if you think uh, basic agnostics or naturalists, they do the same thing. They search uh, uh, alternative explanations for the phenomena, and we are not complaining that they are not justified for that. But the difference is: is it plausible or reasonable to actually doubt something when mm-hmm. you have evidence? For example, the mystic uh, or, or or Aristotelian proof in itself is it actually valid argument and if it is then that's it no problem but if you go to problem of evil for example we have to ask is it valid well if it is does it still disapprove the existence of god of some mm. kind of well no it doesn't maybe because it really depends on what kind of a uh, uh, theistic um, back background I would say you have. Because like not every religious uh, view about some sort of deity is the same, but they have similarities. And especially in classical theism, that's like the basic idea of uh, well, like Anselm says, uh, greatest conceivable being, and so mm-hmm. on and so on. So, probably that is the uh, basic idea of God in philosophy, especially. And it is not just the, some sort of begging the question or ad hoc idea of God, because there is, you know, behind that idea of God, there is, you know, a lot of. Uh, work going on like in the history Aquinas Leibniz and so on Mm -hmm. so yeah we could talk about this topic much longer but I don't think we have (laughs) much time so yeah maybe we should just uh, go into the atonement because Mm -hmm. it's also quite um, essential when you think about a Christian especially the Christian theology and, and the idea of 
sin and justice and forgiveness and so forth. So, um, um, do you have any thoughts about, let's say, penal substitution, which seems to be the most pop popular um, view of this uh, theory of atonement? So, you know, there's a lot that actually goes into the debate on the atonement. So before I describe like what my views are on the atonement and how I assess the different theories, it's worth knowing that atonement, right, means to bring someone at one with something. So mm. to restore a unity that was not there before. Mm. And if you think about the whole gospel, so aside from the crucifixion of Christ, you know, you need to have the resurrection. You yep. need to have right? Christ performing these miracles, living a sinless life. So in, in some ways, I sometimes get a little uncomfortable when the, when the debate on the atonement is just about one specific event. But in reality, I think that the gospel is not just kind of isolated events put together. It's a whole story that builds on each other and requires each of the individual parts and doctrines and beliefs. Mm. So, I mean, and it's kind of my conception of God too, right? So God is divinely simple. He has properties that you can distinguish and identify, but mm. are that nonetheless shared by one simple divine being. And with my view of the gospel is the gospel fundamentally at its core is about God saving human beings and really putting us back into unity with him and towards completion. Oh, but yeah. then within that, within that big story, there are all these little pieces that you know, you can kind of identify and see, and that's kind of what, you know, Christian theology is trying to do, identify the pieces. Mm. So here's my take on the atonement. I think at minimum, uh, okay, so let's first examine uh, what theories of, atonements, uh, of atonement I reject, right? So the ransom theory that God uh, paid the devil a certain debt so that human beings could be free, gives way too much power to the devil, um, mm. and that it, it really puts God in a weird place with respect to his relationship to the devil, you know? Uh, mm. So I, I'm just going to reject that one. Oh, and some yeah. satisfaction theory seems to somewhat be the basis for all the other theories of atonement. So, mm. you know, it, it talks, so Anselm places the relationship not between God and the devil, but between human beings and God. And what Anselm um, argues is that God's justice had to be satisfied and hence, when Jesus dies on the cross, right, and it takes the, well, well, I'm not going to load in too much, but somehow the crucifixion, the, the death of Christ, right, um, mm. uh, satisfy, satisfies the justice of God. So yep. it has to be, I think it has to be something like satisfaction, because legalistic language is used in the Bible to describe exactly how, you know, the atonement went down. So there's that. There's also the fact that it was substitutionary to some extent, right, that uh, there's an imputation or relationship between us and the crucified savior. Uh, you know, so Paul talks about, I was crucified with Christ and I was also resurrected in him. I believe that's in Ephesians or Galatians. Uh, so there's obviously a relationship between us and Christ mm. and it seems to be substitutionary. What was done to Christ eventually leads to our redemption. Mm. And then, you know, like the wages of sinners death and so forth, and the relationship between us and Adam, and Christ is the second Adam. So it seems to me that we need something substitutionary, but we need also something penal in the sense of, let's say, law, right? Hmm. The law has something to say about the crucifixion. So this gets me to at least, at most, the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. But I believe there's, I think that the penal substitutionary atonement is not enough on its own. Hmm. So it explains the legalistic aspect of what God wanted to accomplish through Christ dying on the cross. But atonement, remember, is how do we gain at one minute with Christ? Mm. So in mm. some sense, you know, um, when you sacrificed an animal in the Old Testament, it was to atone for your sins, but it only covered you, right? But the gospel of Christ is not just covering our sin, but actually transforming us. Mm. So in order for that to happen, I think one thing is that, you know, you need to have Christus Victor part of your penal substitutionary theory because Christ demonstrates that the forces of darkness and evil can be defeated and that he is supreme. Hmm. So you need to affirm both the supremacy of Christ, uh, the supremacy of God and the justice of God simultaneously. 
but I'm actually more inclined to then unify these two theories under um, Irenaeus's recapitulation theory of the atonement. So Irenaeus's recapitulation theory of the atonement is that Christ is the second Adam. So before Adam and Eve were our first priest and priestess, they were the first people who could represent us before God, mm. right? And there's deep, there are deeper Augustinian metaphysics to this view, and I can go into that, but I wanna, before I get there, I want to hear your thoughts. But to finish off what I'm saying, when Christ is the second perfect Adam, the perfect representative of humanity, at that point, human beings have the ability to decide whether or not they will abide in the failures of the first Adam or the success, the victory of the second Adam. And God, through the law in the Old Testament, establishes how exactly you can identify who is the true Lamb of God. Who can I, it gives us the ability to identify through the law, right, who justifies us, but also who is greater in some sense than the law, who does more than what the law does and actually sanctifies us. And that is what we find in Christ. So we can discuss the Augustinian metaphysics underpinning this, but let me get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, my uh, basic thoughts about the whole uh, debate about penal substitution is, is, as you said, the penal substitution in its basic is, is quite satisfactory when you consider the a legalistic understanding. But sure... Um, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't still say that it isn't, in a sense, enough. Maybe there is some sort of a metaphysical um, ins insufficiency behind the theory. Uh, I'm not sure, but, but it's also, you know, I would say all the theories, they have some sort of truth behind them, mm -hmm. but they yeah. are not actually correct understanding of what the biblical data says about the atonement. If you, for example, consider Levi Leviticus uh, chapter 17, verse 7 to 9, if I correctly remember where God actually says that the uh, plot is, is, uh, has to be uh, spread because there is life in, it, in the plot. Or uh, I'm not sure if the Hebrew word it nephis or some sort of a, a word describing the living soul or living being. So in the blood is the life, basically. And mm -hmm. that is what, what Hebrews 9, for example, takes mm -hmm. and talks about why we had to sacrifice or why, why those um a priest had to sacrifice animals daily for our sins but on the other hand there is um there is some maybe lack of understanding how this process actually takes yeah the guilt and sin away mm -hmm. if you think well, some skeptics might propose the idea or the problem behind this, like, well, let's say some guy commits some sort of crime. Is it, you know, just neglected or something else because someone else wants to um, suffer or pay that mm. crime or penalty for that person, for example, if you yeah. think the ethics behind this mm. uh, issue. And I think it is uh, interesting. But on the other hand, I think that when you understand the difference between uh, God and his creation, for example, God, as William Lane Craig said in his, I, I think in some of his uh, lecture, he mentioned uh, 
quite good point because uh, he said that God doesn't have the same kind of obligations that we have. And so when you consider like uh, the idea that uh, does uh, the Messiah or does the sacrifice have to be something else rather than God himself when we talk about the Trinitarian idea behind the nature of Christ. Well, I think there is this precise point because if, if you know, God is the only perfect good being and he comes in the, this earth and does this payment for our our transgressions mm -hmm. then i think it is enough in a sense that uh, we as a people as a limited beings as a, a corrupted beings we cannot never fulfill that kind of obligation mm -hmm. or the uh, problem of sin especially mm -hmm. so yeah i might be wrong in some case but i would agree that the basic idea of the mm -hmm. substitution is is adequate yeah i mean like so let's see here uh, there's a lot that in, in what you said that i agree with and maybe i just need to provide some clarification on my view yeah yeah. So my view would be, so take Christus Victor and take penal substitutionary atonement. Mm. I think that both of these theories are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Yep. That's my take. So it depends on also, uh, remember in the beginning when I talked about what I think atonement is about, right? Atonement is about bringing us at one mint with mm, God. So yep. there's something that was broken before and it's finally been fixed. Right. I think, uh, when we examine, let's say, Christus Victor, it gets us what we need in terms of Christ defeating the forces of darkness. Great. But yep. what about us? Right. What about the sin in mm. us, uh, yep. the, the transgressions against the law? The penal yep. substitutionary atonement theory helps us solve that gap. But I think there's a third gap that needs to be explained, which is, OK, look. So before God, because Christ has taken his sin, our sins upon our, uh, himself, and we mm. need that's an objection that we need to talk about, too. Um, but assume for the sake of argument that that can happen, right? Mm. Um, so Christ takes the penalty of sin upon himself so that we do not have to suffer it to some extent, right? So that, that gets us justified before the law. But remember, like the New Testament writers, what made the new covenant different from the old covenant mm. is that the old covenant, the old law, could not make a man righteous. Yep. The, the new creation in Jesus Christ, however, is quite literally a new creation. So mm. we need something else that gets us to bridge this gap. And the reason why I add in Irenaeus's recapitulation theory is actually because of Craig's arguments in favor of the atonement or his explanation mm. of the atonement. So Craig talks about uh, vicarious liability. When you are the superior of another individual yep. and when you are in kind of a, a union together, a contract, if you will, and let's say um, your inferior, your employee, um, I think this was a case called Allen v. Whitehead, where, mm. you know, these employees hire prostitutes to come into their business. Yep. And even though the boss wasn't responsible, the boss was completely innocent, right? Mm. The fact that the business itself was used in a way that transgressed the law, you know, required mm. that the, by vicarious liability, the boss had to be held accountable, right? Because mm. he is the representative of the company, Mm. And hence, his company was used for what was wrong. He owns the company, and then that's how things go bad. Yep. In, in the case of Adam and Eve, right, Adam and Eve, when they broke away from God, their essential sin was pride and the belief that they could become like God. Yep. So in doing so, they claimed a kind of liberation and autonomy from God, saying, I am my own property, mm -hmm. right? So your sins... You have to pay your own sins and hold yourself accountable, but you cannot do that. You cannot yep. become fully good on your own, yep. right? God calls you and brings you into relationship with him, and that's what perfects you, mm -hmm. right? But you have to – I mean, I don't know if you're a Calvinist or not, but I believe you have to respond to the call, right, and freely choose to love God and be in relationship with him. Yep. But the thing is, 
you know, who is, who owns you? Let's put it like that. Who can actually be responsible for you and claim, no, this is my child. This is my son, my daughter, who I'm covering, who I will pay the penalty and responsibility for. Mm. If it's Adam, you're not going, you're not going anywhere. Mm. If it's Christ, right? Christ, who was both God and man unified together, death could not defeat him. He was victorious over death. He paid the penalty for sin. He undid uh, Adam's kind of, I mean, Adam was considered the high, you know, was considered our priest until mm. Christ came and was our true high priest. Mm -hmm. Christ hits all three of these right on the mark. And that's why I think you need all three of these theories of the atonement to come together to get a comprehensive picture. Mm. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. And mm -hmm. I think the idea of superiority and inferiority is, is um, crucial here because, you know, it's not, it's not the same kind of superiority as we would understand like you're the boss and the worker or the slave that's not the same idea instead yeah you know it's the ontological idea if you would mm -hmm. say uh god is by nature superior than uh our ontology because we are <clears throat> made into his likeness as bible says we are not as god but we are like God in a sense that God has made our us in a, his image, Imago Dei, in, you know, the basic idea. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you know, all the creation are inferior to him. And so the problem is solved when he comes to this problem and solves mm -hmm. the case. So I think, you know, if you take a look at Romans 8 uh, verse 3 and 4 where it says um, for what the law could not do weak as it was through the flesh God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering to sin he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Mm. And I think this, these two verses uh, puts the basic idea, you know. Yeah, I mean, so what's very fascinating about that passage in Romans is that it says that Christ defeated or, you know, uh, I yeah. think it was something like in the flesh. Mm, it matters yes. that he did it in the flesh. Yeah. Because if in Christ, you know, we have a human being who was able to defeat evil, pay the penalty for sin, and also be our true high priest, yep. right? Then it actually opens up the door for human beings to be redeemed, right? Yep. For us to have that potential, um, you know, and like the ontological superiority of God, right? Mm. Um, the fact is, in our fallen state, in our inferior state, what we are trying to do is become like God, mm. right? But God, when he becomes like us, in true humanity, he's able to rebuild that connection by having yeah. a human being who is fully unified with, uh, with God. Um, and this is where I want to talk about Augustine. And this leads into actually my views on the problem of evil, which is a oh, really nice segue. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so Augustine, there's a great paper called Why Are There Sinners by Sun Kun Yun of Oxford University. And the paper deals with J.L. Mackey's original logical argument on the problem of evil or logical mm. version of the problem of evil. And Sun Kun Yun actually has a very interesting I idea. So he says, it is possible that God could have created a free and morally perfect world. So this is mm. an idea that Augustine set forward. But God chose to have a, a first world in which there would be pain, suffering, death, and a clash between good and evil, so mm. that you know Christ could enter the world and become incarnate, that we could have the beauty of redemption. And then eventually we hit the final world where everything is made right, right? Where we are mm -hmm. finally redeemed and things are perfect. So there's an interesting point to be said about potentiality or counterfactuals, modality, whatever you want to call them, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, a counterfactual is when you look back, you know, it could have been otherwise that maybe the world 
uh, that there were no stars in our universe and the universe just collapsed. That's a counterfactual. Mm, or when yes. I perform an action, right? A counterfactual could be, um, for instance, like I picked up my phone just now, but the a counterfactual could have been, I picked up, I don't know, my water bottle and to make mm -hmm. this example, right? Yep. Augustine made the argument that human beings, so there's a difference between like, let's say a hypothetical counterfactual and a real counterfactual. So a, mm. hypo a hypothetical counterfactual is maybe like, um, maybe I would be in another possible world, a duck or another sort of animal, right? Mm. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a hypothetical counterfactual, but it's not real in mm. the sense that, you know, um, it, it's hard to imagine in this world how I could somehow, looking back on the way things are, I could say, yeah, I could have been a duck, right? Mm. But even though there's nothing logically inconsistent in that idea necessarily. Mm. So uh, the point that I'm trying to get across is Augustine makes the argument that um, when Adam sinned, right, Adam, who was our high priest, right, made our depravity to some extent, our original sin, our disposition towards sin, the only real counterfactual that was possible for us to some extent. So we could do good things, right? And we could, uh, you know, follow the law to some extent. But mm. the reality is within human beings, the potential for us just to sin and always fall short, that was the mm. only potential that was there. But yeah. when Christ enters the world and is perfect, right, and is able to take away the penalty of sin, be totally unified with the Father and so forth, and with, with, with the Trinity and so forth, we have a new potential that is actualized within human beings that we were not in our sinful state able to actualize ourselves. Only God has the special prerogative in becoming human through the work of Jesus Christ to actualize this potential. And that's kind mm. of Augustine's argument. Um, so Sun Kun Yun uses the analogy of, for instance, let's say that we lived in a world where we said um, it is possible for us to swim, but nobody ever swam, right? Mm. So like we never saw anybody swim. There were no swimming pools, but there was this sign, let's say on the wall that said, yes, it is a possibility that you could swim. Mm. Augustine would say, it, that's a hypothetical counterfactual. It doesn't become a real counterfactual until people actually start swimming, mm. if that makes sense. So mm. if you imagine like a perfect world where nobody ever sinned and nobody ever did anything wrong, the, the, the thought of someone doing something wrong in that world would just be a hypothetical counterfactual. It wouldn't be a real counterfactual. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 I, I can see the idea. But on the other hand, um, if we think about counterfactual um, things, for example, I, I think the basic idea is correct. There might be no um, possible world given that we are as a free creatures in a basic sense, you know, free, that we might always fall assured when we are given the free will let's say somebody would say well if i would have been on the garden of eden i wouldn't have fallen well the problem is how do you know mm. so in yeah and and the other thing would be that you know let's say if we think about the idea that there might be a possible world where i would be uh, let's say a shark or something else then i would say that then i wouldn't be me as an ontological being or yeah he would say i would be a totally different being so in that case i would say logically speaking there might not be a possible world where i as a human being would be the same kind of a let's say if we assume the soul for for example some sort of soul existing or the inner part of animals or humans that the same soul would exist in a let's say that's in that shark because there would be as we know 
in in this actual world we can see the differences between those beings but maybe in some yeah it's it's always you know some sort of hypothetical in in a primary sense but on the other hand i i guess we could say there is true counterfactuals and by the way if you consider like molinism for example um this is precisely the point when you think about the grounding objection like is there any kind of um counterfactually uh, counterfactuals of creature the freedom well i i think there is you know and the good illustration would be like the chess uh, perfect chess player which is in this case god who knows everything every possible thing and could analyze true his by his own nature things and in, in this case he has this <clears throat> knowledge about this contingent or counterfactual uh truths so yeah in this case let's say god could have maybe could have made some sort of uh, another possible world but it's a, the only essential question here is that you know given that we as a uh, free creatures in a basic sense would ever uh, have not ever fallen assured is is a question or assumption which i don't mm -hmm. think we can simply prove in a sense that you know well of course there is there has to be some kind of mm -hmm. like in a in model sense there has to be some kind of world where free creatures would not have fallen away mm -hmm. Maybe there is, but you know, it's 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 only another topic, I would say, because there is all other factors which would, uh, <clears throat> let's say, affect our decisions and all the situations, circumstances, and so on. So yeah, yeah I mean, uh, so yeah, let me let me try to maybe do a, wrap up and do some final points, and then we can discuss these yeah, final yeah. last few points. Yeah, so. Um, let's begin first with um, the idea that you've been talking about where possibly there is a world where no matter what, at least uh, one agent would perform one morally reprehensible act, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is the idea that Plantinga sets forward known as trans world depravity. Yep. I'm actually convinced that trans world depravity is false. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I really do think that you can conceive of a very like fully coherent world where there is moral perfection and genuine freedom. Mm. So Take, for example, like uh, planning a significant definition of significant freedom. If you really reduce the definition of significant freedom down to its core, it's the idea of self-actualization by mm. which when an agent performs an action, it is within their power. This is to say within the agent themselves to perform or not perform the action. If you say, however, that there has to be at least a possible world, or it's a possibility, right, that an agent mm. performs at least one act of wrongdoing, then yep. you'd reject the definition of significant freedom because mm. couldn't they have done otherwise if we really yep. do believe in the idea of self-actualization? Mm. And I think that, I mean, there's other problems too. Like, do we have free will in heaven? Oh, okay. So, you mm. know, like, uh, uh, if we're not going to fall in heaven, then why can't we be like our heavenly state? Oh, it's because we have a different nature in heaven. Well, why can't we have that nature now? Mm -hmm. uh, JL Mackey's argument, uh, what is it? It's logically conceivable that whenever I perform an action by my self-actualization, let's say I perform the good action of opening the door for my grandmother, right? Like it's conceivable that let's say I always open the door for my grandmother mm. or I always go out and let's say help a homeless person. I give what I can. I can live a perfectly virtuous life, just at yep. least hypothetically speaking, right? No logical inconsistency. Yep. If you take the definition of significant freedom seriously, then you got to accept the ramification of that. And I think that theists should accept the ramification because mm. there are better theodicies out there. So I know that there was a lot there. Let me just conclude as briefly yeah. as I can with what my approach to the problem of evil is, right? Yeah. So the first is to recognize the supremacy of God 
So based off of Brian Davies' work on uh, the reality of God and the problem of evil, Davies makes the argument that when we often think about the problem of evil, we assume that God is a person like us. So mm. for instance, what father would allow his daughter to, let's say, um, be murdered one night mm. by a serial killer, even if he knew he could stop it, he had the power to stop it, whatever. It seems like he had every good reason to stop it. Davies says, okay, let's hold up and think about the hierarchy of being, the chain of being. God is ontologically superior. So for instance, if you saw a tribe of monkeys kill each other, or let's say a tribe of ants that mm. throw one of their own off, let's say a little hill and kills the other, right? Or mm. chimps do the same thing sometimes, right? If you saw that happen, would that make you any less of a good person, mm -hmm. any less of a good human being? Well, no, because you are different kinds of beings, right? Mm -hmm. The badness that a being instantiates in their taxonomic class does not reduce yours. Likewise, God, if he is, as the Thomas says, essence and existence, no amount of evil from the inferior levels could ever make him bad, right? And if mm. you take Aquinas's, I think it's the fourth way on uh, perfection, right? If there is a being by which we compare all things to be perfect, you can't throw God out the picture. Yep. So then why does God allow evil and suffering in the world? That's the big question to ask. Mm. I think the first is before I get to that, Marilyn McCord Adams kind of, and Eleanor Stump's idea that the afterlife will heal all the wounds of this life, mm. right? I think that's really important to keep in mind, right? That, that there is a practical way in which the problem of evil is dealt with. Now, why does God allow evil and suffering in the world? One of my thoughts has been kind of, so there's Felix Ocupa, where a world in which God manifests himself in this particular way allows for a depth to love that would otherwise mm -hmm. not be present in other possible mm -hmm. worlds, right? The deepness of God sacrificing himself, of making himself vulnerable, and of us truly persisting to the end, despite original sin, despite the sufferings that we have endured, mm -hmm. right? There's that argument. The second argument is one that I've developed, but one that I've actually found at least in one place in the literature. Um, so I call this the two worlds theodicy. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea is that the reason why God creates a, a world first where there is a clash between good and evil, and then a final world in which there is moral perfection and freedom, is because God, God wants agents who not only are free, who not only are morally perfect, but this third property, which is genuineness, in mm -hmm. which God really allows us to experience good and evil and actually discern for ourselves what we will choose. Only in a world in which you have freedom moral perfection and genuineness, do you have really the best of what God truly desires? Mm. And I think in that case, then you can make the argument that because human beings are temporally contingent beings, we, we go through time, uh, you know, point A to point B, whatever we experience time in this linear fashion, we require experiences and the constant trusting upon God in order to make it through our day. God, on the other hand, has all knowledge. God doesn't need a primer on good and evil. God knows all things, mm. right? So God wishes to create the best of all possible worlds. And this includes moral perfection, freedom, and genuineness. Mm. Yep. I think these together with all the other considerations constitutes a pretty strong argument against the problem of evil. At that point, the atheist, in order to answer the rest of these arguments, has to presuppose a view of God that is not actually consistent with classical theism. Mm -hmm. yeah pretty much you know it's you know the thought about the uh, superiority here is quite essential as well you know in a sense you know as you pointed out the fourth point of perfectionist you know if we can actually uh, conclude or prove that there exists this perfect being Therefore, we cannot just uh, dismiss that argument by saying that, well, it's impossible that there exists evil and this perfect being, you know, because you, first of all, you would have to show why there is inconsistency and why a perfect being wouldn't allow these sort of things. Maybe a perfect being would have a reason or maybe according to his perfectness, uh, not in a moral sense only, but mm -hmm. according to his nature, maybe he does 
know things way much better than you actually know mm -hmm. which which you know changes the picture i i think yeah and um, you know as you said we we if if we think this you know in the same sense like um we should on the other hand if 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 we assume that you know god is totally responsible for allowing these sort of things then you know of course we should and and always should uh, stop every sort of um evil that other inferior beings does and of course you know atheist or agnostic would say well you cannot make and such uh distinction between human beings and animals ontologically but i i, I think you can simply if you think the uh, intellectual side or rationality in in a human beings and uh, well if you go on the that path you know you you should first of all justify your ethics in naturalism and why do you think animals should be stopped stopped when they eat each other or mm -hmm. torture each other you know so yeah there is uh, i guess alternative answers to this uh, problem which which is called the problem of evil of course uh, so maybe you know in I, maybe I found find the basic idea of freedom and the exhaustive knowledge of God uh, one of the crucial and best uh, explanations. Uh, mm -hmm. Despite if you don't make the ontological distinction and the responsibility mm -hmm. of of particular beings, but. In, in short, I would say, well, let's say um, a parent would just allow his kids or her kids to do bad stuff. And then some other, let's say a neighbor comes and says, well, why are you not doing anything? Like, why are you just allowing this to happen? Well, maybe... Uh, this parent is not responsible anymore concerning that the kid is grown up let's say he's or she's 20 or 22 and so we would assume that this this grown up kid would actually have a responsibility of her or his own actions and so the parent himself is not in a sense responsible of that. And I think the same idea applies to this issue. If you take the basic idea, not just uh, taking this an uh, uh, argument, but as a basic idea behind this issue, you know, maybe God as a perfect being is not in the same way responsible of the things which are happening to us because on a one sense we we might assume too much about god or the reality of things going on so mm -hmm. i mean there's a lot of things which we have to take into account and probably many people don't uh, consider this as a strong uh, proofs or cases against the problem of evil because you know we have this uh, intuition about mm -hmm. uh, good and evil and justice and so on and emotional problems as well which is totally understandable but you know in yeah. this case you cannot rely on those facts simply yeah if i could just make one last comment and then i think we can wrap it up here Yep. Um, I mean, so I'm actually convinced that the problem of evil is not the most serious argument against theism. 
Mm. I think it's the most emotionally powerful. It's yeah. the one that people find so compelling because like, uh, you know, so I think the problem with evil is essentially a debate on moral theory, mm. right? So you have to first presuppose some theory of ethics to ground your argument against the existence of God, right? Whatever that is. Mm. And the problem is, you know, so for example, uh, the most popular method today is reflective equilibrium where, you know, reflective equilibrium, you have a moral intuition about how things ought to be. You formalize that intuition into a principle. The principle is applied to a situation. And the test is to see whether the outcome of the principle and your original intuition are still in harmony with each mm. other, right? But the problem is that, you know, reflective equilibrium is very useful to at least moving debates forward, but it doesn't actually get at the substantive question of what is justice. Mm. If, yeah. for example, I as a theist, made the same arguments that I did, um, you know, moments ago, and I presuppose my uh, scholastic metaphysics and my view of what morality is, mm -hmm. it's not difficult for me to at least intellectually see that the problem of evil is not, right, the knockdown argument everyone thinks it was. Mm. Like, the, the more serious arguments I would consider are, like, the actual arguments for naturalism, the alternative accounts of composition and so forth. Those are, to me, more challenging because they get at the root of really the deeper questions. Mm. You know, when I read some of the atheist literature, I'm just like, I don't make the same assumptions you do about the nature of what is good, about what is right. So when you're making these arguments saying, oh, God is not a good moral agent, mm. right? I'm like, you know, uh, what do you mean by that? You know, it's, just, it's not intelligible in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the debate has to begin. Yep, I agree. And so, you know, Maybe the uh, issue will ease if we actually define or we are more careful about our assumptions behind good and evil and justice and so forth. And so in this sense, you know, when you think about the whole issue, you know, it's it starts to be or it starts to make sense in the sense that, you know, when you consider all these factors, let's say as a cumulative case, you have freedom of the will, the knowledge of God, uh, the distinction of uh, perfectness and, and so forth, you know, those all might, you know, pretty much answer the whole basic uh, problem. So, and of course, there is this probabilistic argument against or the probable, probabilistic are a problem of evil where you say, well, it's probable given that, given the suffering and evil in the world that God, uh, that sort of God doesn't exist. Mm, but again, yeah. it depends on the pra background knowledge. It depends on, you know, highly on, on the uh, knowledge of God and the freedom of the will so mm -hmm. sure you know it it might seem as if let's say uh the book of job is a good example that god doesn't care or is, <laughs> is not a perfect being well yeah that's not the case in this case as well mm -hmm. yeah because you're assuming too much about the book of Job, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, Miska, I've had a great time talking to you. Uh, where are you from again? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Finland, actually. Oh, Finland. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm here in the States, so, you know, nothing too special about me. Uh, <laughs> we met through the Thomism discussion group, right? Was that where we met or Catholic um, Christianity? Not sure, actually. I think just in general because you know yeah i have added much american friends you know in general <laughs> just just putting the re friend request and so probably i just um saw you in a, some discussion mm -hmm. and so yeah. i decided to send a request and and so forth and yeah maybe that's the uh probably the uh first step yeah mm -hmm. so well thank you miska for this conversation 
Um, if you upload this, let me know. And I love to watch it again and kind of review everything and share it. So, mm -hmm. uh, yep. well, I guess I'll, I'll talk to you later. All right. See you. All right.